Hello boys and girls, this is Daniel for Rock the JVM, and in this video I'm going to discuss how to read Spark query plans. So this video is for the Spark programmer who has at least some fundamentals, for example how to create a data frame and how to do basic operations like selects and joins, but has not dived into how Spark works yet. Maybe you're even interested in boosting the performance out of your Spark jobs, for which reading query plans is an essential skill. So, I will recommend that you code alongside me in Spark Shell with the links for downloading a Spark distribution on your computer attached in the description to this video. And whenever you need the ideas that I'm going to share in this video related to query plans, just refer back to this video. For your convenience, this video is also in written form at rockthejvm.com forward slash blog. Alright, so here I am in my Spark shell where I have a Spark 3.0 shell open. If you want, you can pause the video and open your Spark shell on your computer if you have it installed, or if you want to download and install it, you can pause the video to do that as well. So, you're probably aware that Spark has this lazy execution model in the sense that you write transformations, but they're not actually run until you call what is called an action, like a show or collect or take. So when you write a transformation, Spark will automatically build up a dependency tree of your data frames, which will actually end up executing when you call an action. Let me give an example. So let me define a value, let's call this simple numbers, as spark.range 1 to 1 million. This will be a data set of numbers. So if I hit enter, this will be a data set of long with the column ID with uh, the type long. Now, if I create a derived data frame from this, let's say for example, times five as simple numbers dot select, and I'm going to use select expert to say ID times five as ID, so the column ID or the numbers in the column ID are multiplied by five and that will be a new column named ID as well. So if I hit on enter, this will be a data frame and notice that this line returns immediately, meaning that the data frame times five is not actually evaluated until I call an action. For example, if I do times five dot show, only now Spark is actually performing the computations. So if you want to see what operations Spark did, you can do times five dot explain. This pretty little thing is called a query plan. Now, when you call the explain method, the final plan known as the physical plan that will actually be run on executors will be shown here. So you can expect this plan for your massive computations before kicking off any job. This is particularly important because the ability to read this kind of physical plans will allow you to predict performance bottlenecks in your jobs. So let me show you how to read these query plans in this small video. So let's go over some examples of query plans and how to read them. So let's go back to this particular plan and let's read that. And we read this query plan backwards from bottom to top. So the first step that Spark does is construct a range object from one to one million in steps of one, so that is one number after the other, one, two, three, four, up to one million, and splits equals six, meaning that this range, this data frame, is split into six partitions. So this data frame is uh, six partitions. Now, the next step that Spark does is on the line above. This is a project which is the mathematical term for a database or a data frame select. So we're selecting the column ID with the identifier 47 long times five, and we're assigning that a name still called ID, but this column has a different identifier, 49. And this second line will be the final computation. Now, you can also read this physical plan backwards in the sense that the end of the computation is a project with the column ID 47L times five as this other column, which depends on, and this is the particular verb, so this line depends on the line below it. So this final computation will depend on the creation of this range. So this will be done once this line below it is done previously, all right? So this is not too hard, let's do another. So I'm going to define, let's call this more numbers as spark range, and let's do another range, one to one million, or 10 million, or however big you want to make it, in steps of two. 
And let's create another data frame. Let's call this split seven as more numbers. And I'm going to use repartition. You might have encountered this operation in your day to day as well. So notice that this line also executes immediately. And uh, if I do split seven dot explain, we will have another physical plan, which looks a little bit different. So let's try to read this one. As uh, we discussed previously, this physical plan can be either read top to bottom or bottom to top. I prefer reading bottom to top for uh, especially simple plans like this. So the first operation is constructing a range from one to one million in steps of two. So that is numbers increasing two by two and then splits equals six again, meaning six partitions. Now, the next operation that Spark does is an exchange. This exchange is particularly important because exchange means a shuffle. A shuffle operation is one of those operations in which data is moved in between all the executors in the cluster. So the bigger your cluster is and the bigger your data is, this exchange operation will take a long time. So exchange Changes, also known as shuffles, are particularly expensive operations in your computations. So watch out for these exchanges in your query plans because they predict performance bottlenecks. In our particular case, the partitioning or the, the shuffle operation that is being made is of type round robin partitioning with the argument seven. That is, all the data is distributed evenly across the cluster into seven partitions. So this is what this round robin partitioning will mean. So a performance tip, whenever you see exchange in your query plans, that's a performance bottleneck. That is, especially if you're interested in improving the performance of your jobs. Now let's do one more and this time let's make it super complex. So let's define, let's call this DS1 as spark.range one, two, let's call this, for example, 10 million, like a big one. Let's create another one, DS2, another spark range from one to 10 million in steps of two. Let's repartition both. Let's say DS3 as DS1, the first range, repartition seven. And uh, let's create another one, DS4 as the other range, DS2, repartition nine. Cool, so we have two ranges and the two repartitioned versions of these ranges, cool. Let's do another one. Let's call this DS5 as DS3, select expert, and I'm gonna do this uh, ID times five thing. So I'm going to do ID times five as ID. Cool, so we have a DS5. Now, let's do a join between this DS5 and a, the DS4 data set. So I'm going to do val joined as DS5 join with DS4 under the column ID. All right, so we have a data frame with a single column ID. That means one of the columns ID here was dropped because we're doing an inner join. If you remember, a join operation has the inner type by default. Cool, so we have a joint data frame from these DS3 and DS5, between the DS4 and DS5. Cool, now let me do a sum of all the values in this joined data frame. So I'm going to do val sum as joined select expert with sum of the column ID. So this will be another data frame with the column sum ID. And this will have a single value inside because this is an aggregation function. Now, before running any computation, let me do sum.explain. So notice that this query plan is pretty massive right now. In production, you will see really massive query plans, but let's go ahead and read this one. Notice that now we have branches. So let's read this bottom to top. Now, if you take a look at all these lines, they have a number inside parentheses. These are called stages. And uh, the numbers here will uh, determine in which stage each one of these lines, each one of these operations will be performed. So naturally, let's start with the line 
starting with the number one. So I'm gonna start with the very bottom of the topmost branch of this tree, and then I'm gonna go to the other one as well. So the first step that Spark will do, the first stage, will be to construct a range from one to one million in steps of one, split into six partitions. Cool. Now, in between step one and step two, we will have an exchange. So notice that we are already performing a shuffle. This is an intentional shuffle because we're doing a repartition with seven, which is mirrored in the Spark query plan by this round robin partitioning with seven. We saw that in the previous query plan. Cool. Step number two, that is stage number two. This will be apparent in the Spark UI as well. This will do a project ID times five as ID. And notice the column identifiers are different. So we are multiplying the values in the column ID with the identifier 60 with the number five, and we're giving this new column the identifier 66 with the name ID as well. This is the DS5 that we're doing here in the code. In between step two and step three, in between stage two and stage three, that is, we do another exchange. This is not intentional. And this is a prep phase that Spark will do to be able to do a join. And I will explain that later. So the exchange here is done by Spark. The partitioning scheme is hash partitioning this time around, so not round robin partitioning. We're doing a hash partitioning. The key by which we're doing the hashes is ID with the identifier 66, which we computed earlier in the previous stage. And 200 here is the number of partitions in which Spark will split this data set. Awesome. So in between step two, stage two and stage three, we have this exchange, this shuffle. Then we have a sort. So we're sorting the data set by the ID 66, which is the same column, ascending nulls first, and some other parameters, we don't really care about them. So before we're doing the join, we're uh, repartitioning this DS5 dataset into 200 partitions by a hash scheme, and then we're sorting this dataset. This is a prep phase before the join. Cool, so we're, we've uh, exhausted the uh, topmost branch of this tree. Now, let's do the bottom branch as well. So. So we have step stage one, stage two, and stage three that we have already discussed. Let's discuss stage four. So stage four constructs a range one to 10 million in steps of two and into six partitions. This will be the dataset DS2 that I've written here in the code. Then in between stage four and stage five, we have not one, but two shuffle operations. That is because We've exchanged with round robin partitioning by our intentional repartitioning scheme. And then the unintentional repartitioning done by Spark as a prep phase for the join with a hash partitioning with this column ID into 200 partitions, much like the topmost branch as well. So in order to do a join, notice that Spark does a shuffle into the both data frames that are going to be joined and both data frames are also going to be sorted. So we're doing a sort in stage five as well. So we're sorting the data frame DS4 over here before we're jo doing the joint in the next line. Cool, so we've exhausted steps one through five. Now, these are all prep phases for the join. In stage six, we have the final sort merge join. This is a particular implementation of joins in which we're joining the data frames identified by the keys ID with the identifier 66, which we've computed earlier in the, uh, in the topmost branch, and ID with the identifier 62, which we've computed in the previous, in the bottom branch of the tree. And the inner is the inner type of the join. So in stage six, we're doing a join operation. This is the actual line that we're, we're writing here. But in this join, multiple operations are implied because after we're doing the join, we need to drop one of the columns. So we are projecting, that is we're selecting just the column ID with the identifier 66. That is from the topmost branch. Awesome. Now, in order to compute the sum, we are doing a sum of ID and uh, Spark will do a hash aggregate in the same stage by running this function partial sum with the column ID with the identifier 66. 
What do I mean by that? In this particular stage, Spark will run this operation on every single partition of the joint dataset. So we're doing partial sums of all the partitions. So we're not doing any shuffles yet. That will be done in between stage seven, six and stage seven. This is exchange single partition. That is, we're bringing all the partial sums to a single partition so that Spark will do a final hash aggregate operations with the sum operator with that same identifier column. So after Spark did the join, in order for us to compute the sum of that distributed data set, we're doing partial sums first by every single partition, and then we're bringing those partitions together, that is the values of all these partitions, the partial sums, onto a single partition, and then we're summing them all together to obtain a single value. So this is how we can read this query plan to understand what Operation Spark will do in order for us to perform complex computations. And this particular skill is invaluable in production because as you can see, we have quite a number of exchange operations, that is shuffles, in our computations. And whenever you spot an exchange, that means a shuffle, and that will be a performance bottleneck in your computations. So this is an essential skill if you want to boost the performance of your Spark jobs. All right, so I hope this was useful. I'm Daniel, and you can find this article at rockthejvm.com forward slash blog in written form, and you can follow me on Twitter and LinkedIn with the links in the description attached to this video. Now, I'm dying for feedback, so please leave yours in the comments, and if you like this video, go ahead and subscribe, because more videos like this will be coming soon. Until next time, thank you for watching.